the United Nations uh, Environment Program back in 2011, they produced a report titled Towards a Green Economy. And they define a green economy as one that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological societies. So this ties in very well with uh, what EENN uh, does. Uh, it also, the green economy looks at a low carbon, resource efficient, and socially inclusive society. I downloaded the, the global wealth report that's produced from Credit Suisse. It's an in in international investment banking institution. And the global wealth stands at 360 trillion US dollars. That is how much wealth that's in the world. Of that, Africa contributes a very tiny or almost invincible proportion of 0 0.67. I actually had to just get the percentage right. Um, Africa as a continent contributes 2.2 trillion US dollars to the global wealth. Now, for a, a continent that's got a sizable factor, it's a very, very low statistic. But then, conservation of African forests and natural resources can actually spur the economic revolution. It's no more about economic development, but more of a revolution. We need to take ownership of actually claiming um, the wealth proportion on the world economy. And the green economy actually helps us to get there in terms of uh, social inclusivity, uh, promoting the welfare of, 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 of our ecosystems as well. Our shared principle really as a ministry is that industrial development is a shared responsibility between both the private and public sector. We have uh, so far um, established uh, 10 sector growth strategies and biomass is now the 11th, 11th uh, sector growth strategy that we are focusing on. Uh, within the regional dimension, we also have um, the SADC industrialization strategy as well as the um, SADC industrial protocol that was adopted in August 2019. All of this prime agro-processing, inclusive of uh, biomass, is one of the key sectors that the region should, prom should promote. Um, our shared principle really as a ministry is that industrial development is a shared responsibility between both the private and public sector. However, our, our experience as a ministry is that the value chain development of uh, biomass uh, 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 projects is quite complex and it, is, it has a lot of inherent complexities, whether it is at the harvesting a site or on the processing or logistics. The previous speaker alluded to transport and therefore the complexity of uh, using uh, biomass projects and developing them uh, requests that we do a lot of work around the logistics to make them smart and efficient and to ensure that we reduce emissions. Uh, some of the resources and input material is also affected by seasonality matters. Uh, the current technology may not be mature. If you look at uh, charcoal, I think we can do much better there. And then there's also a lack of trading platforms or market exchange, especially from the harvesting side as you move towards the processing uh, uh, elements of the value chain. And then uh, skills to finance the transactions that emanate from biomass projects are also very scarce in this country and not many banks and commercial funding institutions actually understand how to structure projects such as uh, biomass. And then overall, we also have an issue of there's, there's a lack of carbon price in the country and uh, we haven't developed our clean development mechanism uh, uh, opportunity for projects so that we can then earn carbon credits uh, internationally. Essentially, we have been working around supporting with uh, GIZ and the German government uh, production of new technologies. We have looked into the financing scheme. In fact, we have now produced a model leasing scheme that we have um, sold to AgriBank. Hopefully, they can roll it out this year. And then we recently uh, launched a pilot training uh, uh, program for harvesters. And then we are also going to create Namibian standards for charcoal this year, and then also a testing center to ensure that the, the, the product is tested in the country. Um, in terms of the bush overall uh, uh, project, we have our approach there is, as a ministry is to, pro, to develop an actual project and then take the lessons learned to ensure that we can then impute in the overall lessons of creating these value chains. We have recently developed an app to assist in um, uh, the harvesters to identify the correct species to, 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 to then harvest, which is quite important as you, uh, charcoal is now becoming, or biomass is now becoming the next frontier for job creation. 
And therefore, there's a large mass of people that have been brought in that can then be the supply to the processing facilities that we are developing. Therefore, you really need to make sure that uh, Tate Haiwa is happy with the harvesting uh, uh, work that was going to be done. Then finally, uh, we are going to work with the BCBU project here for a, an international biomass industrial park so that we can start investigating opportunities of, of uh, imports uh, uh, and, and exports of the product to, to feed other projects, uh, global value chains. We're going to revise the investment incentives and create special economic zones uh, so that they have appropriate support for especially biomass industrial park. But I basically just want to re-emphasize that there is a lot of value addition opportunities that exist within the biomass sector, not only the forest but also the others. Um, it's a vital pillar. The whole sector is actually a vital pillar to develop our overall bioeconomy, which is something that we have not yet explored as a country effectively. Um, we will develop as a ministry an appropriate policy on value addition uh, for the sector so that we can then bring everything, all the enablers, the invest, the incentives, the financing strategies towards a, 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 a comprehensive document. And that we will continue to be an anchor as a ministry to not only on policy development but also to help structure projects uh, so that we can then demonstrate that these are key for job creation, rural uh, uh, development uh, uh, catalyzation as well as overall economic structure diversification. The biomass or the forest resources um, are, are needed for human needs, which uh, most of us are aware of, and then environmental uh, roles. Um, the actual uh, human needs, uh, again, um, we, we start uh, from the basic needs for uh, uh, livelihood of majority of our people in terms of firewood, in terms of uh, poles for, for, for construction of their homesteads, um, uh, the firewood for, for heating and lighting. Uh, so all those things are, are, are actually uh, basic needs for the people. Then environmental roles we know um, uh, in, in terms of uh, soil protection or conservation, um, the uh, 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 production of uh, oxygen and uh, also uh, uh, k k keeping the, the, the converting the carbon and keeping the carbon. So all those uh, uh, things are in, in environmental factors uh, that uh, justify the need for for the forest resources. We have a a, a, a lot of threat on these resources, uh, particularly when it comes to economic. Uh, or, or, or financial benefit from the, these resources. The moment uh, you leave uh, the ecosystem, uh, human being and the wildlife and the, uh, livestock to interact, without much of the uh, money making, the, the ecosystem balances itself uh, in many cases. But uh, when we come in to, to bring some, some money making, then uh, uh, there's a reason to, to, to be worried about the the uh, 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 continuous uh, well-being of, of these resources. We come up with the, the, the system of uh, permit system to regulate and uh, guide the people that uh, uh, if we are not taking care of this, uh, and uh, the, 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 some of the activities, economic activities, are quite a serious threat to the uh, well-being of the forest. If you take, uh, for example, uh, uh, charcoal production, which is a, a good economic uh, uh, factor, uh, it is, if it's not uh, properly uh, 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 guided, it can lead to serious desertification. And based on those commitments uh, the, 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 uh, of the government to take care of these resources to ensure that uh, those current generations and the future generations are getting uh, the, the benefit for, uh, from these resources, uh, it is uh, justifiable for us to talk of uh, sustainable management of these resources. If uh, we are not uh, uh, taking care of these resources and uh, do not bring balance between economic gain and environmental uh, sustainability, we may actually get into danger of our resources. So like I mentioned, we signed to this convention. We are obliged, obligated under that Article 2 of the convention. I won't go much into detail. This is the number of reports we have submitted so far. We submitted the current one, which has a greenhouse gas inventory of the year 2015. Now in 2020, we are busy with the fourth banner of that report, which hopefully we will submit by the end of this year. We are supposed to submit it at the Conference of the Parties in Scotland, but unfortunately, as we know, due to the outbreak, 
uh, the, conf uh, the, uh, the uh, COP was cancelled. So these are the gases, the mandatory gases. We are talking about carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. But all of the, the units is gigagram of carbon dioxide equivalent, which I'll be presenting. These are the sectors, like I mentioned, we are covering the energy sector, which can be further be subdivided into nine other categories, where we were talking about road. Road is further divided into civil, uh, road transport, and so forth. We are talking about industrial processes and product use. We are talking about agriculture, forest, and land use, which is also further subdivided, as you see later on. And then we are talking about the waste. So we use the 2006 IPCC guidelines, which are recommended by the UNFCCC for all signatory parties to the convention to use this methodology, which was uh, developed by a group of uh, experts. So our current inventory, we were advised to go back to the year 1991, despite us telling them we only got independence then. But we, most of the data we used, it was data which we worked backwards. So it's not accurate data, but we just used what we could have available until the year 2015. Like I mentioned, we remained the sinks throughout the, uh, the period since uh, from 1991 up to the year 2015. That's because the land sector, the removals from the land sectors, the removal from these bush encroached areas exceeded the emissions which come from the road and from the livestock, so to say. I won't go into the constraints and gaps, but the constraints and gaps basically is the issue of data. Like the question was mentioned, when will we have a full inventory of our forest for us to be able to really estimate where our sink is, how much of the sink capacity do we have. So this has been a big problem. We had a map which we got from the regional center based in Nairobi uh, for the year 2000 and for the year 2010. And that map was really not good because some parts of the Namibia desert turned into a forest in 2010, which is obviously cannot be possible. So yeah, the main constraint there is the issue of, 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 of data, having reliable data to base your emissions on. Charcoal production, why? The main purpose is the responsible restoration of land use in Namibia. It sounds like a heavy word, but I also have to mention, many people go into charcoal production to make a quick buck. And that is the challenge we set at the NCA as well. People think, if I go into charcoal production, it's going to solve all my economic problems. And that is not the case. 45 million hectares are severely affected. In the past, we were speaking about 30 million for the past 10 years. This is worse now. It's 45 million. And it's growing year on year. If I look at our production capacity in March, we had a record month just before the, the lockdown came. In April, we had the worst month ever. Our, our average production was 5,000 tons of charcoal exported. But suddenly, in May, in June, we had record months again, higher than previous years. And that is in spite of all the logistical challenges that we encountered. Because there was suddenly a, a, a drive from international companies buying more charcoal. Because people were experiencing, and luckily for our industry, good summers overseas. So people are doing, using more barbecue charcoal. And the whole charcoal industry at, at that point, I just want to say this, is a very, very volatile industry. We cannot predict what's going to happen next year. We know the trend is upwards because we see it. But tomorrow something can happen where the charcoal will all of a sudden go down. We don't expect it to happen, but it is possible. Then, why do we stand for FSC certified farmland? We have received uh, many people complained about it. And there's one reason, only one reason, and that is uh, the responsible and sustainable harvesting. There's somebody is looking into it that we are doing it sustainably. And that's why we support strongly the Ministry of Trade's initiatives to do the standards for Namibia. Then here's a result of charcoal. You'll see one of our new kilns, hybrid kilns there. Cooling pipes. Why do we use cooling pipes? So that the charcoal can be burned quicker and we have the cooling down process that we have an overnight process. Instead of three, four days, we have now a one day kiln. Less smoke is used, less wood is wasted. Our conversion factor is coming down. Um, internationally, the, the conversion factor of charcoal is between 20 to 25 percent only. And that's also the case in Namibia with the old burning methodology. We've brought that down to between 30 and 40 percent through the one-day burning method. And that is 
daily. So you reduce the whole process, the impact on the environment, and also better quality charcoal coming out. Then just very briefly on our co-products, very important to look at the co-products, because these co-products can also benefit to a greener environment, specifically mentioning biochar. We absolutely underestimate the value of biochar in the country. The time durations decrease from three days to one day. I'm even mentioning seven hours from start to finish. Charcoal is done. Quality of charcoal is enhanced. Heat in the kiln is controlled. And optional fitment of smoke distillation reduces smoke by another 60%. We need more collaboration with policy stakeholders. We need to advocate the use of better burning techniques. We must use equipment to reduce smoke in the air, distillate smoke to harvest byproducts. And the last point, and the most important, responsible and sustainable harvesting of our natural resources. At the end, we are using our own resources, saving on, on scarce uh, foreign exchange reserves, and so on. Just uh, to put some figures to it, currently we are using uh, only 0.3%, uh, a, a third of a percent uh, uh, of uh, the sust uh, or standing biomass, or 8.3% of uh, uh, the sustainable uh, harvest. Uh, so there is uh, scope uh, for uh, additional uh, economic activities, job creation, and uh, value creation in, in the country. Very briefly on, on charcoal production, um, probably this data is already outdated. We have more than 600 uh, charcoal producers. We employ up to 10,000 uh, uh, workers in the charcoal production uh, uh, alone, so on the farms uh, producing uh, charcoal using the kilns and retorts. And uh, the export value has increased from um, about 125 million in 2011, which accounted for 0.3% of, of total exports. It more than doubled to 0.7% of total exports or 650 million in 2019. And uh, since charcoal is not uh, um, categorized as a manufactured product, it's part of, of agriculture in the national ac accounts and export statistics, it accounts for 17% for of total agricultural exports. It's the third largest agricultural export uh, product after uh, livestock and uh, grapes. Just to, to, to illustrate the in increase uh, uh, over time in, in charcoal exports. Um, but it's more, it's not just the charcoal production. Once you have produced the charcoal uh, on the farmland, it's uh, transported to, to uh, charcoal processors um, that uh, um, pack, uh, sieve and pack the charcoal according to the sizes. And so we have more than 40 companies in, involved in the uh, processing and uh, uh, roughly estimated uh, about 1,200 additional jobs are created there. Um, then most of these kilns, or no, not most, all of the kilns, are produced uh, domestically, uh, creating jobs in, in, in the manufacturing sector. Then on, on transport, uh, also it was mentioned, it's a logistical challenge, but it also uh, increases efficiencies in the transport sector because uh, often transport companies have cargo from the port of Wolfes Bay inland. They drop the containers there, there and return empty to the Wal uh, Wolfes Bay port mainly, or e also to South Africa, because some of the charcoal is transported to South Africa. But uh, having return cargo increases efficiency in the sector, makes also other uh, transport uh, activities more uh, competitive. And uh, charcoal exports plays a larger role also uh, in, in the handling uh, of cargo and at Wolfes Bay, uh, about uh, almost 160,000 tons uh, of uh, charcoal was uh, uh, going through Wolfes Bay uh, last year, 
it's, uh, it accounted for uh, almost 9% of total cargo uh, in, in Wolfersby. And again, you have employment effects there uh, and, and uh, efficiency gains and so on and so forth. So Namibia is a considerable greenhouse gas sink because the emissions are negative. And when we look at the removals, virtually all of these removals are attributed to bush encroachment. The increase or the, the, the bush encroachment it absolutely dominates the national greenhouse gas inventory. Namibia is only reported as a greenhouse gas sink because of bush encroachment. Meaning, without bush encroachment, Namibia would be a source of, of greenhouse gases. Uh, now, when we talk about large-scale debushing operations, that would constitute a, a dis large disturbance to, to bush encroachment. So it logically could also have uh, quite an impact on the greenhouse gas balance of the country. Um, and while economic and adaptation benefits of bush control <coughs> and biomass utilization are undisputed, the mitigation impacts are becoming increasingly important, particularly when when it comes to establishing international value chains because the, the, at the receiving end, the, the users of biomass will have to look at, at the mitigation um, balance or, or at the greenhouse gas balance of, of these value chains. Um, if clean technologies and rangeland restoration are mainstreamed into the bush biomass sector, greenhouse gas removals by far exceed the emissions from even large-scale BCBU operations. So we don't have to be concerned about the greenhouse gas sink um, if clean technologies are used and, and a focus is on range and restoration. 